the triune God. The doctrine of the Trinity as It's the noun God that you have used. There is one body and one spirit. These verses in Isaiah there, you can, you can pick up the, the three members. Welcome to the I Believe presentation series. I'm so glad you've joined us for the second episode. Let us bow our heads as we open in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have once again to study the Bible Lord, we thank you that this is a revelation of yourself and your character. I pray that you would teach us now in Jesus' name. Amen. In today's study, we'll be looking at the Trinity, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are only able to know God because he has chosen to reveal himself to us. If he had not chosen to reveal himself, we would not be able to know him. So what has God revealed about himself? In other words, I want us to break this down a little bit further. What has God revealed about his nature or his being in the Bible? What has God revealed concerning his attributes? And what has God revealed about his character? Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So what we have to work with is what God has revealed. Let us not speculate beyond that. But let us see what God has revealed in the Bible for our benefit. And I would like to, on that note, share a number of different scriptures with you, looking particularly at the being of God or his nature as God, the attributes of God, and the character of God. So let's begin our Bible study. Let's start off by looking at the being of God. Here I would like us firstly to focus on the Godhead. Genesis 1 verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now this is right in the beginning at creation, on the sixth day of creation, when God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Already here we pick up that there is more than one member of the Godhead. When God says, Let us make man in our image. Genesis 3 verse 22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Again, a, a plural reference to God. Let me also read Genesis 11 verse 7, looking when they were building the Tower of Babel. And God said, Come, let us go down and let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So God says, come, let us go down, and there confuse their language. Again, a plural reference to God. And then, lastly, on this point, I would like to share Isaiah 6 verse 8, where I, this is referring to Isaiah's call. And he says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. So God, the Lord was speaking, who will go for us? So here we don't find specifically the Trinity, but we find that there is more than one person in the Godhead. Who will go for us? Now let us look more specifically at the persons in the Godhead. and. 
I'm referring here to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, in the next three presentations, Pastor Ezra will be looking at Father, Son, and Holy Spirit separately. But here I want to look at where in the Bible do they speak of these three in the same context. So there's a number of other verses where the Bible speaks about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But here I want to specifically look at scriptures that have all that mention all three in the same context. So let's begin here in Isaiah 61 verse 1. Now Jesus quotes this in Luke chapter 4 and he's and this is Jesus was um, referring this to himself and he says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me that is upon Jesus because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound so in this one verse, we see the spirit of the Lord God who came upon me, that is the Messiah, Jesus, because the Lord, I suggest referring to the Father, has anointed me, Jesus. So there's indication here that all three persons of the Godhead are referred to in this verse. Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17, moving to the New Testament, the New Testament speaks more of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here at Jesus' baptism, there is evidence of all three involved in the same event. So Matthew 3, 16 and 17 says, When he had been baptized, that's Jesus, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. So we see Jesus being baptized, the Holy Spirit descending on him. Verse 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Clearly the voice of the father speaking about his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So again, another indication of father, son, and Holy Spirit in one context. Let us now move to the great commission that Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascended to heaven. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So here we find again the, the instruction to baptize in the name, interestingly singular, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us now turn to 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14, which is known as the apostolic blessing. Now, maybe you've heard this shared as a benediction in church. And it reveals again the three persons of the Godhead. It says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So again, here in one context, we see Jesus Christ, the love of God. I suggest the Father there and then the communion of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 verse 4 to 6 also speaks and mentions each of the persons of the Godhead. And it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, I suggest that is Jesus, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So it mentions there one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Let us now move to Titus 3, verse 3 to 7. And in the next number of scriptures, I would like you to see how each member or each person of the Godhead is involved in our salvation. Titus 3, verse 3 to 7 says, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. 
but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let us now move to perhaps a more clear one in Hebrews 9, verse 13 to 14, which says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, which through the eternal Spirit offers, offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we see here the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, that's Christ, without spot to God. I assume that is the Father. So again, in one context, seeing indications of all three persons of the Godhead. And lastly, on this note, I would like to share 1 Peter 1, verse 1 and 2 which says, as Peter opens his letter, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So again, we see God the Father, we see the Spirit, and we see Jesus Christ featuring in one context. So as our, an article on our Adventist Church website puts it, a team, thinking of God, the three persons of the Godhead as a team, a team has a common goal. While each person may fill a different role, they all work together to accomplish the mission. The triune God may be compared to a winning team, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit work together in ways that a human team would never be able to, never be able to for a common goal. While each person of the Godhead has a distinct role in the plan of salvation, they unite in their mission. Each person of the Godhead is working for our salvation in their own, they each have their own role, but it's one mission to seek and to save the lost. Then as we wrap up the being of God, something else to keep in mind is we, have, we serve one God. Let us now look at the oneness of God. We don't serve three gods. It is one God in three persons. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, that which has been revealed to us is what we, we have to work with. But God will always remain a mystery to, to wrap our minds around one God, three persons, I don't think we'll fully comprehend this, but we need to base what we believe on what has been revealed. So Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Let me read here from a little Bible study guide in his steps. I thought it, it was helpful in explaining um, how we see this. There is only one God, yet we know him as three persons who are revealed in Scripture as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible makes no attempt to resolve the riddle of the Trinity, the three in one. So what we have revealed is what God has given to us. And may we make sense of it as we as we seek to understand this the the three persons of the Godhead as one. I want us to, to move now um, off the, the being of God, but looking at some attributes of God. Firstly, I would like us to look at the God as creator and life giver. And we have an upcoming study which would deal specifically the whole study on God as creator. But the Bible begins by stating this fact. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
God is introduced to us right in the beginning as creator, the one who gave life to us. Acts 17 verse 24 and 25 also teaches us that God gives to us life. It says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God is our creator. He made the heavens and the earth, the world, and everything in it. He gives to us life and breath and all things. I want us to look another aspect, another attribute of God. He's relational in nature. I think this is part when we have been created in his image, we are also created relational beings. But God in himself is also relational amongst the persons of the Godhead, but he also desires relationship with those whom he created. So Exodus, I want to share three scriptures here. Exodus in the book of John and Revelation, indicating his desire for relationship with us. Maybe just to back up a little bit, in the book of Genesis, we find God having face-to-face -face communion and fellowship with Adam and Eve. Because of sin, as recorded in Genesis chapter 3, they had to leave the Garden of Eden. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, sin separates from God. And that that face-to-face um, relationship that God had in the beginning is something that God wants to ultimately restore, I believe. But always God has been committed to this relationship. Even though throughout history it has been different, but God has been um, working towards the day when one day that eternal fellowship would be restored. In that light, Exodus 25 verse 8, God says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God desires to dwell with his people. He is a relational God who desires a relationship with us. This is further demonstrated and even foretold in the sanctuary services and come to, came into fulfillment when Jesus came to this earth. John 1 verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, God in Christ, God became a person and dwelt among us. He wanted a, I think this is one evidence that he, he wants this relationship with us. And he was even willing to become one of us to save it and also to, to relate to us in a way that we could identify. And then lastly, in the book of Revelation, after the great controversy has ended after the, the, the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. Listen to how God's desire will be fulfilled there. It says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Over and over, we see God's desire and commitment to a relationship with us. So God is relational in his being. Let's look at another aspect or attribute of God. He is eternal and immortal. Immortal being he's not subject to death. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So even before the creation of the world, God was there before the beginning of this world, from everlasting. As far back, <laughs> there's no, no beginning to God and no ending to God. Something difficult for us to wrap our minds around, but that is the truth about God. He is eternal. John 5 verse 26 um, says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. God has life in himself. He is the life giver. He is also immortal. One could refer also to 1 Timothy 1 verse 17 in this regard. Then looking at God is also all powerful, omnipotent. I'll share a few verses here as well. Genesis 18 verse 14 
question is asked, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, this was a case of Abraham and Sarah um, and providing a child for them past childbearing age. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. He is all powerful. Jeremiah also speaks about this. And Jeremiah states to God, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. A little bit later in the same chapter, even God says, Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And indeed, there is not. There is nothing too hard for God. He is all-powerful. And also in the context of our salvation, Listen to Matthew 19, verse 26. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men, this is impossible. With men, we won't be able to find salvation or save ourselves. But with God, all things are possible. Then let's look at God as omniscient, all-knowing. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, And there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times things that are not yet done. Saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God is all knowing. We read in 1 Peter 1 verse 2 that the father, the foreknowledge of God the father was mentioned in that verse. God knows before it takes place what will happen. He knows the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. God is also ever present. He is always present with us. Listen to Psalm 139, verse 7 to 10, which says, Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell or the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. God is ever present. Let us now look at God is also unchangeable. He does not change. There's a number of verses that speak to this, but I'll read Malachi 3 verse 6, where God says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. I am the Lord, I do not change. Praise God for that. We can trust in God. He does not change. His character does not change. And then lastly, as we wrap up our sort of introduction to God in the second episode, let us look at the character of of God. How has God been revealed in the Bible? We can summarize it in one word, and that is love. I I really appreciate and value 1 John 4 verse 16, where John writes this, and I believe God would have us have the same experience as John had, that we would be able to say the same. And he writes, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So God loves us. He has demonstrated his love for us in in his plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. And this comes from a heart of love. God is love. I believe everything he does is based on his character. It is an outflow or an expression of who he is in character. God is love. This is the essence of his character. So as we seek to wrap this study up, let's move to application. Here I would like us to consider what is our response to God's self-revelation. We said in the beginning that God has revealed himself. We wouldn't have known God if he hadn't revealed himself. So how do we respond to God's revelation of himself? I would like in the same way to ask this question, what is an appropriate response to God's revelation of himself to us and of his desire to have a relationship with us? I would like us to read 1 John 4 verse 19, which says, we love him 
because He first loved us. Our love to God is always a response to His love for us. He loved us first, and we love Him in return. And I believe that is an appropriate response when you've seen revealed in Scripture who God really is. When you've learned about His character of love, the, the only appropriate response that we are moved to make is to love Him back. So in summary, I would like to share our fundamental belief statement on the Trinity. It states, there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and ever-present. He is infinite and beyond human comprehension, yet known through his self-revelation. God, who is love, is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. I hope that you've seen some of that revealed in Scripture today. So as we end off, I would like to make this invitation to you. Desiring a personal relationship with human beings, God has sought to reveal himself and his character of love to us. I would therefore like to invite you to get to know God as he has revealed himself in the pages of Scripture, in the Bible, and to enter into the personal relationship with God that he desires with each one of us, to enter into that personal relationship with the God who loves you and I with an everlasting love. And I believe that that would be the purpose for why God has revealed himself and his character to us, that we might walk our lives with God now and into eternity. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, I thank you that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us. Lord, as we consider the scriptures, consider the self-revelation to us, I pray that you would lead us step by step into knowing you more and more and to know you personally, to experience your love in our lives. I pray that you would guide and bless us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join us again as we continue our series, the I Believe Presentation Series. Thank you, friends. Thank you for joining us. And I'm sure you've got questions or even comments. Please feel free to send an email to the email below or reach out to us on any of our social media outlets. We are so, we are so glad to have you interact with us and we are praying for you as you discover what you believe.